Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Matt Kelly for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Matt, first of all, welcome back from uh, the week of July 4th. Uh, thank you, Tom. It was good to be away and have a vacation for a week, but uh, we got plenty we could talk about. So I am back and ready to rock and roll. Well, Matt, before you went on hiatus, you wrote a, a blog post about yet another fine uh, that Carnival Cruise Lines has sustained, uh, not in the area of EPA compliance, but in the area of data protection compliance, specifically in the state of New York, um, from the New York Department of Financial Services. What caught your eye about this new order? Yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, this was interesting because one of the very first things that might catch people's uh I about this order is that this was the New York Department of Financial Services. And of course, Carnival is not based in New York. They are based in Miami. And uh, so right away, I was intrigued, like, how did New York's Department of Financial Services, NYDFS, how did they have jurisdiction over a Florida company? Well, it turns out that because Carnival sells travel insurance and other types of insurance like that to its customer base online, including the customers in New York. There is the legal nexus for DFS to exercise jurisdiction over Carnival. Uh, but when you peel away into the details of this case, this is actually really interesting for a lot of people who might know that DFS does enforce a cybersecurity rule but you might not necessarily realize when you are or are not in scope or in jurisdiction for DFS and what the rule actually requires. So when you read through the details of the settlement and the IT controls that uh, Carnival had not put in place, the policy failures that Carnival had not, uh, that had Carnival had allowed to tolerate, uh, there were some very interesting examples of ways that you could commit a cybersecurity error. Uh, and then also it raises some interesting questions about what is or isn't material that should be disclosed and to whom, because uh, I know a lot of people might think, okay, cyber, you're supposed to disclose that. The SEC is talking about it for investors and whatnot. And there's some overlapping issues around disclosure of cybersecurity breaches as well, that uh, this is just a very instructive case in all sorts of ways about how a large organization might trip up over over cyber regulations. Well, before we get to those, like Matt, I have to say a few words about the absolute inanity of Carnival Cruise Lines in not okay. understanding that when you do business in the state of New York and when you sell insurance in the state of New York, you're subject to the state of New York insurance regulations. And I will remind our listeners that the first DFS case involving this law around cybersecurity was an insurance case, chartered insurance, the very first. And if you didn't wake up at that point, Mr. In-house lawyer who covers insurance for sale in the state of New York, shame on you. Uh, if you have a business that has any ancillary selling of insurance in any state in the United States, you're selling insurance in that state and you're covered by the full panoply of laws, rules, and regulations regarding selling insurance. You don't have to be New York Life selling life insurance in the state of Texas, the state of Massachusetts, or the state of New York. If you're a puny little cruise line with no operations out of New York, but you sell insurance in the state of New York, you're subject to insurance regulator of the state of New York. And guess who that insurance regulator is? the Department of Financial Services, which used to be called the Department of Financial Services and Insurance. There's a clue for you. So I, I was incredibly offended by that. And to think that or to not have the awareness of we are selling insurance and we are not understanding that we are subject to the insurance requirements of that state is just, I can't tell you how, uh, just that boggles my mind. Well, but. in fairness to Carnival, they uh, I think that they did know they were covered by the law because they were certifying their compliance with the regulation. And th Tom, this is where we can start to get into things is, you know, they were certifying that they were complying with the cyber regulation, except they actually were not in compliance. They made some very basic block and tackle failures while they were certifying that everything is fine. And then lo and behold, here we are. You had violated your certifications and whatnot. And it became a big mess.
So that was one point of your blog post I really wanted to hone in on because you uh, articulated that clearly in your blog post. They did certify. You specify the years they certified and you specify the certifications they made. And all of those certifications were false. And to the point where the Department of Financial Services, parentheses insurance, said, no, these certifications are not valid. So if you knew you needed to be certified, you might want to look up what the certification requirements are, because if you incorrectly certify, you're in a lot bigger world of hurt. So now that uh, we've gone kind of through the general counsel part of this, uh, let's move into some of the compliance points, because you, you really analyzed it, Matt, as you do with most of these issues, both in a tactical and a strategic manner. So what did you see from the tactical non-certification perspective that we could learn from this case? So here's what Carnival actually did that was erroneous or non-compliant violation of the regulation, uh, is that like many companies, Carnival outsourced the management of its email services and they used Office 365 from Microsoft. That unto itself, no big deal. Tons of large companies do that. But the New York regulation requires that you use multi-factor authentication, which is where you have to enter your email and password. They send a text one-time code to your phone that you put in and whatnot. But you have to use MFA anytime somebody from outside the network is trying to log into the network, such as if you are on the road somewhere and you're at a Starbucks, you want to check your email and you log on to the email server, that is when under uh, New York's cyber rule, you have to use multi-factor authentication. Uh, but in 2019, it came to light that Carnival hadn't done all of that yet. Several of its subsidiaries working in New York hadn't yet fully implemented MFA. And that had allowed some hackers uh, to exploit the uh, Carnival's email system. They got in there. And they, from I think April through July of 2019, they had gained access to about 120 Carnival corporate accounts and they had access to several hundred New Yorkers personal data because one of the subsidiaries of Carnival had not yet fully implemented MFA. Now that is a failure of technical controls. You are supposed to have it. You didn't have it done. By the time this failure had happened in 2019, uh, companies subject to the cyber rule were supposed to have had MFA uniformly applied for at least a year at that point, and they didn't. Uh, so there was that. And then they also had a second failure of um, ultimately there were four cyber breaches that happened from 2019 into 2020. And Carnival had not a, a reported those to DFS in a timely manner which is 72 hours after you become aware of the breach, you're supposed to report it to DFS. And the reason Carnival had not reported it to DFS within the 72 hour window is they didn't have that requirement in their incident response program. So they, why would you? It wasn't in there. It wasn't in the standard procedure of this is what we do when we have a breach. Uh, eventually, those breaches were reported to DFS, but it was more like months and months, or I think in one case, a full year after the breach happened, Carnival finally reported it to DFS. But so long story short, they had technical failures. We did not implement MFA and they had these policy management failures. Our incident response program omitted the step that you have to report this to DFS within 72 hours. And so then you can see that, you know, those are basic block and tackle errors. But Tom, what is also interesting to me is because these breaches happened four times over the course of two years, and I think three out of the four happened through phishing attacks. DFS also said that is a failure of cyber training for your employees because they keep falling for this. So it does raise some interesting questions we can get into in a moment about what is a material breach. You know, it was just a couple of hundred New Yorkers who suffered a privacy breach. Well, that, that's not material for a big company unto itself if you are judging a breach's severity on the total number of records. But if you start to think more expansively about how did this breach happen? Well, the breach happened because you didn't have the right IT controls in place. That is more severe of a problem than just 
So we had, you know, a couple of hundred records get exposed. That that stinks for the couple hundred people. But if you have a million records, that's not material. But if the actual issue is that we hadn't implemented the right IT general controls, that's a big deal, even if it's two records. So this is why this makes this case so interesting for CISOs and auditors and compliance officers to dissect. This is these rich level of <laughs> failures that happened here. But beyond this rich level of detail, Matt, I also saw a much broader message that we could carry to uh, compliance professionals uh, outside data protection, but specifically here where you were able to wed the, the need for policies, controls, cybersecurity expertise, all wrapped around, and in, in even compliance or legal, all wrapped around with uh, better oversight and management. So from a strategic level, what did you see that intrigued you so much here? Well, it's a really good reminder of what you need in cyber capabilities to avoid making these mistakes. So let's take the MFA, uh, for example, where they had failed to implement that across the entire enterprise while they were certifying that they had. Um, the proper prophylactic control against that is you really need very strong control mapping capabilities. Um, you know, and we can get into some of the nitty gritty of GRC software here, but you know, you will have a GRC software tool that maps out all of the regulatory requirements you have, many of which will overlap if it's HIPAA and it's PCI DSS for credit card information, and it might be something with the GDPR, and now it's something with the New York cyber regulation, a lot of them will have the same requirement. So you can map that requirement against multiple regulations and then say, okay, well, what are the controls that we need to have in place to fulfill this requirement? And then you have to map out those controls match it to the regulatory requirement, and that you have to monitor. Have we actually done this? Have we implemented it across the entire enterprise? If we haven't, which part of the enterprise hasn't done it yet? If we they haven't done it yet, have we emailed the process owner to tell them, do this now? And then when they ignored us, did we get an escalation alert so that we could go to their vice president and say, we said, do this now, and we mean it, and you know, bring more pressure to bear. It's a lot about developing the capability to know what your requirements are, know what controls you have, what controls you don't have, what remediation steps you need to take. Have they been taken? If not, whose neck do we need to choke to make sure that's taken right away? Um, those are the kind of capabilities that you'd need to implement. And that's true whether it's a technical control, that's true whether it's a policy thing, like our incident response plan must include a step that says, report this to DFS within 72 hours, make sure that clause is in there somewhere. And there are tools out there that can help you go through all of that for all of these regulatory demands that are out there. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we will need to have as corporations. You're going to need to have these capabilities because this only gets more uphill from here forward. You know, you're only going to have more cyber regulations. You're only going to be relying on more third parties, there's only going to be more potential threats coming at you, and you're going to need these capabilities, certainly throughout the rest of this decade. And Tom, I suspect, for really for the rest of our natural lives, you'll need to figure this out as a company because the need isn't going away. Well, Matt, in your closing section entitled Compliance Lessons, where you uh, kind of wrote out what you just articulated uh, for the CISO, map out what controls are necessary, uh, identify controls you don't have in place, and then track your progress on those. I wanted to maybe translate that into uh, uh, perform a gap analysis, find out what gaps you have, and then remediate and monitor that. Or in a broader compliance speak, perhaps say, uh, perform a risk assessment, uh, identify with that risk assessment any uh, gaps in your compliance program, remediate, and monitor going forward. And that's a lesson that... Uh, I think we're never going to quit saying uh, as long as we have these enforcement actions, it's going to be a lesson uh, to, to be learned. And if CISOs haven't understood that as well as perhaps anti bribery and anti-corruption compliance practitioners who've heard it for the last 15 years, uh, perhaps they will start to understand that. Um, I wanted to end maybe uh, with, uh, actually I wanted to speak a little bit about the DFS 
And I know I threw some shade on uh, Carnival for failing in my uh, estimation to understand their obligations under the DFS and the regs regarding cybersecurity. But the DFS is one of the major enforcers and regulators around cybersecurity, obviously because of their stature as uh, the uh, Department of Financial Service regulator for the state of New York, where many of the world's and United States banks are domiciled, but also for insurance companies that may no longer be in Hartford, Connecticut, and mm -hmm. they may have offices in um, New York, but they actually put out a fair amount of commentary around cybersecurity. And yes, it's fairly basic. Nevertheless, if you're starting out in cybersecurity, your company you could do uh, a lot worse than simply review the DFS regulations and look at their requirements for a minimum, not best practices, but minimum compliance program and literally start from there. So I'm always intrigued when the DFS does come out with, with an enforcement action. And I think uh, businesses who have a touch point in the state of New York should consider whether through happenstance, hook, nook, or crook, or intention, they are regulated by the DFS, it, it will require a level of regulatory compliance, but it also could offer you an opportunity to uh, perhaps take a look at your own program, at least against the DFS standards. And if another regulator comes knocking, then you could point to that as uh, we put this in place for our company. Yeah. And Tom, I should note that um, DFS has numerous um, punishments that it can mete out. One thing that it did with Carnival is it revoked Carnival's license to sell insurance in the state of New York. I, I don't necessarily think that's going to derail Cardinal's, uh, Carnival's business uh, opportunities, but that's a fairly draconian and permanent sort of uh, punishment. Be, you know, you're not going to buy your way out of that. Um, so they can have monetary penalties. They can take these more uh, aggressive actions about revoking operating licenses. And if we want to be cynical, which I always try to be on these podcasts, uh, you should remember that the enforcers at DFS, that is a time-honored way to climb the political ladder in the state of New York. If you are head of DFS, you could, in theory, run for attorney general. You could run for other office. You could seek higher regulatory offices, say, at the federal level in Washington. So they do have an incentive to you know, enforce the law with vigor and zeal because A, it's good that we should have this, but B, you know, there is some political upside for people who um, enforce the law with DFS. They have, they have higher rungs on the political ladder they could climb. I'm not saying that's why they did this here, but you know, they're, they have incentives, like many state level enforcers, to do their job zealously because there is political upside to that that uh, you, know, you have to keep in mind if you're a company subject to them. Uh, well said. Uh, well, I uh, look forward to seeing what we come up with next week, Matt. All right, Tom. Thank you.